We'll get a little bit of that later, actually, um, one of our composers. So as we continue, um, but before we get started and get everybody in here, does anybody have any questions from from things in the last two weeks? We're, we're sort of, for this week, we're sort of shifting um, a little bit from where we were last week. And so there won't be a lot of, we won't have the sort of review time. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I appreciated the fact that the clarification on Lent and when Lent kind of was established back in the Council of Nicaea, but how much of the liturgical music that we're experiencing for um, Lent today came as a result of the Roman Church or how much after the Reformation? You know, that's a really good question. We'll have uh, some of some of both, actually. Um, we have a, a pretty wide, wide range of that tonight. A number of things after the Re Reformation. Um, in fact, um, I don't think we actually will have any pre-Reformation music tonight. Uh, yeah, no, we'll have, they'll all be post. And on Sun, and the idea, with this, sorry, my chair just went down. Now I'll rise up. <laughs> um, and the idea with the class is that we'll complement a little bit some of the some of the offerings that we have liturgically, and so we won't have any repeats of, oh well, this is what we did three weeks ago or something like that. It'll be, it'll be all new. But these are all um, these are all earlier. But one of the great things. With Lent, and actually, we'll we'll have a quote from Benedict the Sixteenth. I thought found, was very interesting about Palm Sunday and and the scene there is that this is something that we really share as Christians, particularly with those in the liturgical traditions, where some of the very maybe more very specific things about what happens, like at the Last Supper or when we commemorate the Last Supper with the bread and with the wine and what goes on there, might differ. Some of the general trends readings and all of that are are are, are shared and, and that's wonderful so theoretically you can go into if they're liturgical someone who follows the lectionary you can go into any roman catholic lutheran episcopal church some presbyterians follow the and and get the same readings and and the same thing anywhere in the country which is pretty remarkable actually um incredibly forward thinking i think it was in the 90s with the revised common lectionary late 80s early 90s i i wondered especially about the lenten music and i i, I guess i think i've been here well i've been in this country on easter every sunday except one year and i was in Seoul, south korea and and they did sing jesus christ is risen today and we were at the catholic cathedral because it's the church we could find <laughs> yeah oh absolutely and, and, and the service was very similar yeah. no it is and i misspoke we will have one roman catholic work if we get far enough tonight um <laughs> but and actually the recording we'll hear is of a roman catholic cathedral choir in london um as a teaser sorry i'm having a bit of a domestic dispute between the dog and the cat. So if you hear barking or something like that, my apologies. Um, <laughs> any other questions before we sort of get started tonight? Well, yeah. this, this, well. Isn't a, this isn't a question, but um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about David and Bathsheba. And one of the things I, I forgot when I, I was going on about that story, one of the things, one of the reflections that I meant to share with you that night and forgot was that um, when um, the messenger was describing to David the terrible things that this, some guy had done and David said, well, we got to find out who that is and punish him. And the messenger said, well, you are the man. Now, how many sporting events have you been to uh, or heard him on the radio or the television or and everybody's screaming, you're the man. And I thought, you know what? That's just possibly biblical. <laughs> That's it. That's fantastic. <laughs> Paul, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, John. Okay. Um, you're talking about the liturgy similar 
between Catholic Episcopal and Lutheran, Church of England follows this exact same thing we do, like every Sunday, it's the same uh, gospel, the same Old Testament lesson, the same epistle. And also the other question is, what Catholic church are you talking about in England? Is it the Westminster Catholic Cathedral? You nailed it. Yeah, Westminster Catholic Cathedral that they have a resident, or they did until like last year, it was a big yeah. scandal. Um, they had a residential boy choir um, and the administ they'd had it since the early 20th century. Uh, the administrator of the of the Catholic school said, "No, we don't. We don't need to have yeah. this." And the music director resigned because then the boys wouldn't have the rehearsal time and everything. Yeah. But yeah, no Westminster Cathedral. They do. Uh, uh, they have a Willis organ there, a big Willis, yeah. and they do yeah. every year a Saint Cecilia festival with Westminster Catholic Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, and Saint Paul's Cathedrals, and combine oh, all three so choirs in November for Saint Cecilia. Truly an all-star kind of concert, speaking right. of sporting things. Wonderful. So, well, why don't we get, why don't we dive into Passion Tide then? Um, so, um, does anybody, uh, does anybody know about this or want to share anything before I just sort of start talking about it? I remember than, obviously growing what up said, with, like, I remember growing up with the 28 prayer book that the Sunday before Palm Sunday was called Passion Sunday. Exactly. Exactly. And anybody else? Thank you, Donna. So, yeah, no, that's it. Exactly. Um, up until 1959, uh, actually, it was, it was a way that they could sort of spread things out. So the fifth Sunday of Lent would be Passion Sunday. Uh, and Passion Tide would be, or excuse me, the first Sunday of the... Pa uh, Passion Tide, 1960, uh, Pope John the 23rd renamed it the first Sunday of the Passion, and then in the 1969 revision of the liturgy by the Roman Church, the season Passion Tide was simply eliminated, and Passion Sunday became the fifth Sunday of Lent, and then Palm Sunday, which had been the second Sunday of Passion, uh, uh, became the Sunday of Passion Palm Sunday, which is what we have in the 1979 prayer book. And so, okay, this is okay. Who cares? Why are you telling us this now? This is all irrelevant information. Well, actually, it's not entirely for our purposes. The next piece that you will, that I'm going to uh, play a recording of for you is a piece called Greater Love Hath No Man by the English composer John Ireland. And it was intended as a meditation for Passion Tide. So this recording, um, is done by the choir of Westminster Abbey, uh, James O'Donnell conductor, Daniel Cook organist. And I should say before we begin, I also have Mark uh, Stotler, the assistant organist and I have, we're futzing around a little bit with Zoom and so hopefully the sound quality will be better this time than it was last week. Um, and if it's really terrible, please say something or if it, it doesn't work, that kind of thing. So let's hear some greater love. I'm going to share a screen. So let me get you. Can you all hear me OK? Still? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let me get you the texts. And here's some music.
great. So, oh, 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 stop, stop, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's not, we're not there yet. Um, so does anybody have any comments before I talk a little bit about John Ireland and, and greater love before I, before I sort of stack the deck, as they'd say. Do you like it? Not like what? it? The Boy Sopranos were fabulous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Difficult part, difficult intervals. Absolutely. No, and the, and the organ accompaniment, the registrations were spectacular. <laughs> Lots of text painting with that. Um, uh, what else about the... Did, did you find it odd that he sort of... Um, all of those texts, I'll share the screen again. It's sort of a hodgepodge of, of a verse here, a verse there to sort of create a narrative. Um, and this was something that began a little bit earlier, but that Ireland and particularly into the 20th and 21st century really quite get a lot of um, where it's, it's, it's biblical, but yet you're really sort of creating your own narrative. Uh, as you can see, in fact, even the first two verses are out of sequence. Uh, it's actually love as strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love, but um, that's neither here nor there. Um, any other thoughts with it? Like it? Dislike it? Seem old-fashioned? I actually liked it, but I thought it was the first part of it seemed more of a celebration to me. And then it went back to the more pensive, um, the last verse, um, a total different tone. Whereas the ones we listened to last week were more plaintive and um, asking for. Yeah, no, especially when, when you get to the moments where, um, sorry, back to this sharing. Oh, come on. Uh, especially when you get into the parts of you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, um, who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It, it really is. It's fortissimo. The organ is really loud. They're using the, some of the very loudest stops on the organ. Um, the painting of Ireland sort of looking to, to, to better things ahead. Um, and any other comments, questions? So John Ireland, uh, as a young man was nearly orphaned because his parents died when he was very young and it, uh, went to study at the Royal College of Music at age 14 to study organ and piano where he studied composition with Charles Villiers Stanford, who is someone that we, we hear a lot of his music at the cathedral. Um, did a Bachelor of Music degree from the University of Durham, and he taught at the Royal College of Music where his pupils included Benjamin Britten. Um, probably, I would argue, the, the one of the, if not the greatest British 20th century composer. Really tremendous stuff. But uh, that was a relatively short amount of time uh, that Britten studied with Ireland because he described Ireland as lecture Ireland as drunk, absent, or hungover during his tutorials. And so after, I think about a year, a year and change, he was like, enough of this. And, and Britain went to study elsewhere. <laughs> um, one thing with Ireland that we will encounter with a lot of the composers that, that we listen to in, in this is that he was incredibly self-critical, so much so that he destroyed many early compositions saying, you know, these are not good enough. Marie Storfley, who we'll talk about later, did that. A number of a number of them did this. Um, one interesting, couple interesting things about Greater Love. It became really popular during the First World War. And anybody, what about this would would maybe make it make it so much that way? Any particular words? Anything like that? I'll show, I'll show you the, the, the text again. Particularly the very last about reasonable service. Um, 
which is very interesting, um, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Um, and, and I bring this up because it's also interesting to note that sort of church music is, is not always even outside of sort of propaganda for such things. And the first, I mean, this was piece was 1912 composed in, and then the, the First World War, of course, from 1914 to 1918. Uh, and, and a war um, in Kansas City, we are so blessed to have the unbelievable World War I Museum and but such an awful war where really nothing is resolved you know a few a few people change seats all of this but and a lot of questions also 1912 being um the year the titanic sunk and fictionally for those fans of downton abbey downton abbey begins in 1912 i believe with with the, the sinking of the titanic in the air uh, the former heir dies in that, if I'm not mistaken. But Paul, so, Paul, when you say yeah. that it was really popular in the First World World War, do you mean like it was performed a lot in churches, or it was popular like in just mainstream culture? Like, what do you mean it was popular? I, I, I mean, just it was used a lot in churches, and I think for memorial services, it hadn't gotten much play before that, and then as a sort of World War One during that time people became acquainted with it and its message and it got programmed an awful lot and got popular enough that he actually orchestrated it in 1924 um and again popular being a relative term for church music but yeah um sort of that message any other questions concerns comments so and a wonderful piece of church music so next we move ahead um let me do a share screen um sorry so we move ahead um to mary magdalene so um would anyone care to read a little bit about about Mary Magdalene and Jesus. I will. Mm -hmm. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, plan to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Thank you, Donna. So um, this is a pretty familiar story to us. Um, Mary Magdalene, uh, not always portrayed uh, in the best way, uh, though she was uh, one of the people who saw the risen Jesus. Uh, the first people, couple of women and she was one of them um so why why are we talking about this well there's a wonderful piece uh, by william walton entitled a litany um and um here is a recording of a litany and this recording is actually by an american choir the choir of saint james in los angeles uh, conducted by james bonamani
Oh, um, just a second. Let me. I'm going to stop the share and, and reshare. Great. So, what did you think of that piece? Good, bad, ugly, indifferent? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. I think he really kind of got his money's worth out of resolving there at the end, like three different ways on my tears, but I thought it was great. Oh, yeah. No, tr absolutely tremendous. I'm so glad. Yeah, the dissonance, the, his use of dissonance and resolution is just incredible in in this what else do you notice with it um well the first thing that's sort of interesting is he actually wrote that when he was 15 years old if you can imagine it was not a typo like way tears it should have been wet tears but that's neither here nor there um but um also just interestingly about walton uh, his father was an organist uh, and singing teacher. His mother was a teacher who had, been, or who, excuse me, had been a singer prior to being his mother. He joined the choir of Christ Church Cathedral, Oxford, at age 11, 
and the dean of Christ Church noted his musical potential and so showed so excuse me so showed some of his scores to Sir Hubert Perry, one of the most illustrious musicians of that time, who said, quote, there's a lot in this chap, you should keep an eye on him. At age 16, he was admitted to Christ Church College uh, as an undergraduate, one of the youngest undergraduates in its history. Uh, the joke at the time was he was the youngest undergraduate since Henry VIII had been a student there. Um, and interestingly, although he had had many uh, was around many musicians, many music teachers. He was largely self-taught. A lot of his exposure to music came within the choir stalls of beautiful Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford. And those people who would more traditionally be described as teachers simply said that they're, in their work they offered him advice and were not particularly teachers. Uh, Walton was also very well known for probably uh, his Imperial March and Orban Scepter good um, good uh, regal pieces for coronations and these sorts of things. So, okay, any questions about Walton and Drop Drop Slow Tears? Great, so we're gonna move ahead um, to palm branches. Why in the world would we be talking about palm branches? At at least outside here, it sounds like the rain is really coming down, and I don't know of many palm trees in Kansas City. Um, why palm branches? Is there anything coming up in this Passion Tide having to do with palm branches? Palm Sunday. Um, anyone? Palm well, yeah, in, in, in the Holy Land, there's lot of palm trees, I presume, or there wouldn't have been palm branches for them to wave. Yeah, exactly, for the waving uh, during Palm Sunday. But one interesting thing when sort of preparing that I learned some more about palms and palm branches that were very, I thought was this was interesting, maybe you will not feel this way. Uh, in ancient times, they symbolized goodness, well-being, grandeur, steadfastness, and victory. And they were used actually early on in the book of Leviticus um, and when talking about the festival of booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And let me share my screen once again. So I'll, I'll just summarize a little bit. Um, at the beginning, chapter... This is Leviticus 23, 33 through 43. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, on the 15th day of this seventh month and lasting seven days, there will be a festival of booths to the Lord. Skipping ahead to verse 39. Now the 15th day of the th seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall keep a festival with the Lord lasting seven days, a complete rest on the first day and a complete rest on the eighth day. On the first day you shall take the fruit of majestic trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord for seven days. And it um, goes on, you shall keep it as a festival to the Lord seven days in the year. You shall keep it in the seventh month as a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall live in booths for seven days. All that citizens in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So this is actually something that's still celebrated today. Um, it usually happens in late September. Uh, this or early October in 2021, it'll be September the 20th through September the 27th, and it's actually one of three pilgrim feasts in the in the Hebrew Bible. What's a pilgrim feast? Um, well, that's when young males were required to go to the temple to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice and to bring produce from the fields as an offering to God. Uh, the other two were Passover and Shabbat. Um, and still to this day, practicing a Jewish people do this. They build a temporary structure outside in their yards and 
they spend time in there, they eat their meals, they sleep there. They In colder climates, I guess they're allowed to go inside, like if it's unbearably cold. It's a very interesting thing. So very early association of palm branches. Next, we go to Psalm 118, which is associated with the Festival of the Booths, and verses 19 through 29 are appointed for Palm Sunday. Would anyone like to read those verses? Oh. Anyone? That, Paul, that's not up. That the, the audio examples is showing instead of the verses. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, How's that? Is that better? Mm -hmm. Great. Would anyone care to read? Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you for you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna. Lord, send us now success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. He has shined upon us. Form a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Yes. It's interesting. There's at least three or four verses there that we use regularly in the service. I'm sorry, can you say that last sentence, that lead, and then... There it... were at least three or four of the verses that we use regularly. Um, this is, that the Lord has acted, we will rejoice and be glad in it. It's one of the ones that's regularly in our service. And... Yes. Yeah, no, it's it's a wonderful psalm. Absolutely wonderful psalm. Um, and so Palm Branch is also King Solomon. We Dave brought up Bathsheba earlier and King David and... Well, King Solomon was the product of their union, their second child, the first, of course, dying in childbirth. And when he built the temples, he had palm branches carved into the walls and onto the door of the temple. First Kings chapter 6, verse 29 tells us, He carved the walls of the house all around about with carved engravings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. In ancient Mesopotamia, uh, the Assyrian religion identified palm trees as a sacred tree, as they believe it connected heaven and earth. The crown of the tree was heaven, and the base of the tree was the earth, and they were connected by the very long trunk. It can be like a long. Uh, when I lived in L.A., it's actually kind of scary when the, when, the, when the palm fronds fall down when it's really windy or something, because they're huge, and it, you, you never know when that's sort of going to happen. In ancient Egypt, palm stems represented long life, and palms were carried in funeral processions to represent eternal life for the people who had died. In the ancient Olympic Games, victors would return to their homes waving palm branches, and this practice was brought to Rome around 293 BC. And in Rome, they especially took on the meaning of victory the Latin word palma represented victory. So like a, a lawyer who might be arguing a case in the forum who would win would then decorate his door, doorway with palm leaves. Or a military victor would wear a toga with a palm motif on it in a military triumph. And interestingly, because of this thing, this element of it, we actually see um, palms almost morphing into peace, since a military triumph would represent the cessation of war. And so therefore the palm almost becomes 
becomes that. And then we move to Revelation chapter 7, later in the Bible, with palms. Um, and I will we'll skip ahead. It's a wonderful reading about heaven and what heaven is like with the multitude that no one can count from every nation. Verse 9, after this I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the Lord of God and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Beautiful, beautiful thing. So this is palms. And we heard about Hosanna. Um, so this is a word in our Psalms and a word that we use uh, in our own Palm Sunday liturgy. Does anybody know what this word means? Put a guess? Well, the, the typical definition is actually save us please. So it's a, it's a plea to God. Though in, in the instance of Palm Sunday, it is used triumphantly. Um, so rather than save us, God, it's moved in, in, into a different way. And Pope Benedict describes that in this way. In the Hosanna acclamation, then, we find an expression of the complex emotions of the pilgrims accompanying Jesus and of his disciples. Joyful praise of God at the moment of the processional entry, hope that the hour of the Messiah had arrived, and at the same time, a prayer that the Davidic kingship and hence God's kingship over Israel would be reestablished. So now we find ourselves at Palm Sunday. And this is not the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They don't actually specifically mention palms. Sort of interesting. And the sort of sequence of events is a little bit different than in John. Because in the Synoptic Gospels, actually, Jesus' entry back into Jerusalem comes before Jesus goes to upset the money changers in the temple. Actually, one of my favorite Bible stories and one that we heard is the Gospel this past Sunday. Um, so, but in the Gospel of John, there's actually more of a timeline given in which Jesus' entry is six days before Passover, which is why we celebrate Palm Sunday when we do each year. And interestingly, it picks up in John chapter 12, verse 12, which is the very verse that we left off of. At, we finished with verse 11 in the reading about Mary Magdalene and Lazarus. So uh, let's continue with that. We'll do the John setting. Would anyone care to read? I'll read. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Uh, where do I end? I'll yeah. go ahead and um, end after verse 14. Oh, 14. Okay. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Wonderful. And so we will do a couple of Hosanna set to the son of David settings, which are based upon uh, Matthew 21, verse 9, and Luke 19, 38. The first is by Orlando Gibbons.
So that was the Choir of Westminster Abbey, conducted by James O'Donnell. And the other setting that we will hear is by an almost exact contemporary of Gibbons, Thomas Wilkes. And this recording is of King's College, Cambridge, uh, directed by Stephen Cleobarry. <laughs> So what did you think? As you can see, they're almost exact contemporaries, 1583 to 1625, 1576 to 1623. I'll be honest, I couldn't decide which one, as I like elements of both of them, and they were both so short, and I thought, we can share both of them. Oh, um, both of them, the polyphonic writing, the polyphony, and the resolution to use the intensity really brings out the meaning of the words. Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Both both Gibbons and Wilkes were tremendous madrigal writers. And you can you can hear the wonderful text painting in the Gibbons, the um, upward passages for in the highest heaven, in the highest heaven, and the peace on earth, the much more static moments. What about the Wilkes? It was a little bit more somber. It was exciting, but it, it, it wasn't quite as joyful, would you say? Or a different kind of joy, maybe. Anyone? So. I was gonna say, I'm yeah. sorry, I was talking and I had it on mute. Um, I think the first one was definitely more joyful, but I think it's significant when you look at the fact that both of them were written over 500 years ago and look at the, the staying quality that they've had to be used continually through these years and still would be extraordinary to have in a service this, right now. Oh, absolutely. No, it's it's incredible. The sort of, I always find musical Darwinism to be one of those interesting things of what sorts of, what kinds of pieces last. And sometimes they're based on, well, they were in a significant event, the wedding uh, march from Lohengrin for example, was a, a, a lower level noble who used that, you know, the here comes the bride. And it got to be very popular uh, because of that. It's a neat piece by um, by Wagner, but it's, but in some pieces just sort of have a, a staying power and, and these, are, these are among those. So a couple interesting things, not just about Gibbons and Wilkes, and I promised you some cursing and drunkenness. And this is when we get to that. So Gibbons was maybe more of the straight, on the straight and narrow of the two. He was a chorister at King's College, Cambridge, a gentleman of the Chapel Royal, organist of Westminster Abbey. Um, 
these sorts of things. Uh, his son was the teacher of Purcell, whereas Wilkes was a much more colorful character. He'd studied at New College, Oxford, and was the organist of Winchester College and then Chichester Cathedral, uh, where he began in 1601, 1613 cited for drunkenness. 1616 reported to the bishop for being, quote, a noted and famed for a common drunkard, a not notorious swearer and blasphemer. He was dismissed by the dean and chapter for being drunk at the organ and using bad language during the divine service. But he was a really good musician, and so they reinstated him until his death. Um, so any questions about Wilkes, uh, Gibbons, oh. anything like that in our, la in our remaining seconds? One of the things that I wondered about, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. One of the things I wondered about when I was looking at the 